Amen. Grab a seat. Good to see you guys. If you're new, I'm Josh, uh, a preaching pastor here. Good to see you guys. Welcome. If you would, grab a connection card in the seat pocket in front of you. I um, always feel like an airline steward when I say that. Seat pocket in front of you. But if you would, grab one of those or grab your phone real quick and, and uh, go to uh, the App Store, download Crossview uh, Community Kennewick, and uh, that way you can fill out a connection card, uh, follow along with some of the announcements that are on there. Uh, but grab your bulletins, grab the connection card in front of you. You will have an assignment of filling something out in just a second. Um, I love the verse that talks about as the deer pants for the water, so uh, my soul pants after you, longs for you. And so I, that's my prayer and my hope for this morning that you guys would, would long and, and desire God as a deer pants for, for water. Well, we're in the book of Romans chapter 3. Go ahead and turn there uh, before we dive into it. One of the most painful, self-destructive, energy-consuming exercises uh, that the human soul can try to do is deal with guilt on, on your own. If you try to deal with guilt on your own, you are going to be um, you are going to be thinking about self-destruction. You're going to be thinking about, uh, man, I, I can't do this. I, I, and you're going to be depressed all the time. Guilt left unchecked leads people to, to abusing alcohol, to abusing drugs, uh, to despair, and sadly, even suicide. Uh, I did a, uh, a few, I've done hundreds, or not hundreds, I should say almost over 100 weddings in the last 11 years of pastoring, and I've done three funerals. Uh, I did one here. It was a suicide funeral, and it was a friend of mine uh, who used to play bass uh, when he went to our church when it was at Chief Joe. I hadn't seen him for three years, uh, and just, just broke my heart to see that. Um, but, uh, you know, the only unforgivable sin is refusing Jesus Christ. Praise God that my friend took his life, did know Jesus, but uh, it's, you don't want to see people do that. You don't want to see people give up, and guilt left unchecked can lead even to that. Guilt is a deadly, deadly thing. Here's the deal. A, a Band-Aid could be blaming your parents, Okay, blaming, uh, or even blaming your, our heavenly parent, blaming God, that can be a band-aid to kind of help you feel good about your guilt. Like, well, it's my, you know, my dad raised me this way, or it's God's fault. Or you can blame, uh, blame your boss for firing you, or, or blame your spouse for divorcing you. Uh, this may, may kind of be a band-aid for your guilt, but it doesn't fix your guilt. This is why we desperately need to daily experience the one that bore our sins and paid for our guilt. He bore our guilt on that tree, on the cross. The one that makes intercession uh, at the right hand of the Father, he daily makes intercession. Think about that. Doesn't that put a smile on your face to know the one that paid for our guilt, paid for our sins, makes intercession for the Father? Uh, at the, uh, this is huge. The book of Romans is such a strong reminder of who we were, we were slaves to sin, and who we, whose we are, whose, whose we are, which is Jesus, we're, we're, and, and, and we're sons and daughters. This is now who we are. We are sons and daughters of God. But how do we know? How can we be assured? How can we know that our faith is genuine? that our guilt has truly been removed. Well, let's read our passage. Check this out. And um, I usually preach out of the ESV. Um, uh, one of my favorite professors, incredible guy that actually translated the book of Romans out of the NLT. It's the only book he translated out of the NLT translation is Romans, and it's one of my favorite translations for this book. Uh, so we're in the NLT today. Um, this is... Romans chapter 3, and we're going to start with verse 21. But now God has shown us a way to be made right with him without keeping the requirements of the law. As was promised in the writings of Moses and the prophets long ago, we are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. For everyone has sinned and we fall short of God's glorious standard. <clears throat> Yet God... Yet God, with undeserved kindness, declares that we are righteous. Someone say amen. Isn't that good news? He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty for our sins. 
For God presented Jesus as a sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus Christ, uh, Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. This sacrifice shows that God was being fair when he held back and did not punish those who sinned in times past. See, they had faith in the Messiah that would come. Let's keep going. Verse 26. For he was looking ahead and including them what he would do in this present time. God did this to demonstrate his righteousness. For he himself is fair and just, and he declares sinners to be made right in his sight when they believe in Jesus. Can we boast then that we have done anything to be accepted by God? No, because our acquittal is not based on obeying the law. It is based on faith. So we are made right with God through faith and not obeying the law. After all, God or after all, is God the God of the Jews only? Isn't he also the God of the Gentiles? That means a non-Jew. Uh, of course he is. There is only one God, and he makes people right with himself only by faith, whether they are Jews or Gentiles. Well then, if we emphasize faith, this is critical, does this mean that we f forget about the law? Of course not. In fact, only when we have faith do we truly fulfill the law. This is the word of the Lord. So why do we need this passage? I think it's so important that we, we ask this question. It's kind of like going to the doctor, just going like, hey, why should I listen to you talk about medicine? Why is this important? You know, here's how you're sick. Here's how we're all sick. There is a tendency to think that just because we hate guilt, we hate it. And we even think about it and try to deal with it. And we love the idea of the gospel that our faith is genuine. We're good to go. Look out. <laughs> Be the, the fire alarm's going off. Here's the main idea. When we have a genuine faith, it's Christ's work. Uh, when, when we have faith in, uh, um, when we have a genuine faith in Christ's work on the cross, his righteousness actually will get lived out in us. His righteousness will become our righteousness. Amen. This is an incredible thing that we're not just put in right standing, but his righteousness will, will be at work in us. Galatians 2.20, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who is at work within me. This is huge. Hey, if you have this tattooed on your calf, yeah, you can look at his calf later. No, don't do that. Um, his wife's like, no, you may not do that. But yes, powerful verse, so good. Some say, why would God go to all this trouble Go to all this trouble from climbing down from the throne to climb into a cradle, to climb up to a cross, to have his beard pulled out, to be spit on, to be betrayed. All this pain, to have the guilt uh, of, of us to become that, that object of sin, even though he was sinless, to do all of this. Why all this work? Why can't our sin and guilt not be such a big deal? Why does it have to be such a big deal? Here's the deal, if God just swept our sins under the rug, uh, it would make him unrighteous. It would make him not just when we know in fact he is infinitely good, he is infinitely righteous, so he can't sweep our sins under the rug. You know, I was thinking about something and I told my wife, and she was just like, that is kind of weird that you thought that. But last night, first time in my life in a real large way, I, I realized there was, time, there was a season in my life that when I didn't know him, if I had died, I would have been eternally separated from him. Josh Pasma would have been eternally separated. Like there was, in the last 38 years on this planet, there was a season that if I would have perished, I would have died a second death. I was telling that to my wife. She's like, oh, that is, okay, that's interesting, kind of dark, but it, we, we have to swerve there, though. You have to, like, realize that. It's not like, oh, I'm Josh Pasma, the preacher, I, I'm okay, I'm good. It's like, no, whoa, whoa, think about that. Like, let that sink in. And, and I, I'm doing that for myself and being a, a, an object lesson. I, I, are, have you done the same thing to go like, that's what I deserve? I deserve a second death? I deserve eternal separation? But God, that's how, that's how verse 20 starts, 21. But now God, but, that's a therefore. Therefore, God has shown us a way to be made right. This is a huge deal. And again, if we are experiencing Christ's righteousness, we no longer have to be tired 
and weary of dealing with our guilt and living in condemnation and swimming in it. You guys ever swim in your, your guilt and just, you lay up at night, awake at night, swimming in your guilt? The pre- prescription for that uh, is, is the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is the power of God for salvation for all who believe. People consumed with guilt are desperate for righteousness. They're thirsty like a, uh, like a deer pants for water uh, or uh, like our cat Crouton. We, we actually have a cat named Crouton. Uh, we, our kids found this out um, and, and I found this out. Uh, we were going for a little jog, okay? And I'm pushing the stroller so I got the two younger kids in the stroller and the cat decides to follow us and I'm, I'm jogging along and the cat... It's a fat cat, okay? It's, I mean, don't dis- disrespect. You can tell I'm kind of a dog lover, but I, I make fun of my cat sometimes. He is panting. Like his tongue is sticking out and he's panting and we've gone a block. Yeah. So I, I'm not even making that. I mean, that is with, ridiculous. My daughter's just like, is he panting? But she said, she's eight. She's like, is he painting? And I meant, no, he's panting, panting, sweetie. But we, we should, it, man, it's like, it's 9.35 in the morning. It's like, we've already gone a block, right? We've only gone a block. It's 9.35. We should be panting for him. We should be thirsty for him. Um, and someone that is guilt-ridden is thirst, thirsty for righteousness. There's good news. There's good news. God did this, verse 26, to demonstrate his what? His righteousness. Can we see this on the Sky Bible here? Uh, God did this to demonstrate his righteousness, for he himself is fair and just. He made sinners right in his sight when they believe in Jesus. Righteousness is the major theme of Romans uh, we, we know uh, Martin Luther was, was actually converted by re- reading Romans 1 and verse 17 that talks about the righteousness of God, that basically his righteousness becomes our righteousness, totally blew him away. Uh, you, you guys remember Martin Luther, he was a monk that at the time uh, the, the Catholic ch- church was selling indulgences and you had to do, uh, you had to do acts of penance to, to earn righteousness. Uh, and this is saying, whoa, but God did this. This is such good news. His righteousness can become our righteousness and not just be in right standing where we're like, hey, look at me, I'm right with God. But, but actually he's alive in us. So again, it's the major theme of Romans. It's mentioned 30 times in the book of Romans, the, 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 the topic of righteousness in some way or another. It's talked about 30 different times in the book of Romans. Paul, Paul's big mission is to show those that um, think they are right, uh, to, to show them that they're not. There's none righteous, no, not one. And so uh, imagine, imagine Paul, he's got two things in his hand. One, he's got a baseball bat, okay, uh, and, or a hammer. Think of like Thor's hammer and, and honey. So he's got honey and a hammer. And it's like, you're, oh, you're guilt-ridden? Let me show you the honey of Jesus' gospel. Oh, you're, you're prideful and arrogant? Let me show you the hammer, okay? Hey, there's none righteous, no, not one. So it's like honey and a hammer, that's, that's the goal. You're like, oh, I'm hungry for, for honey, <laughs> Genuine faith in Christ's righteousness makes us right, but also his righteousness becomes ours. That is the main goal. Uh, That's the main idea. His righteousness becomes actually ours. Chew on that. Really think about that for a second. When you're, when you're parenting, and man, you just, you're getting ugly, okay? I mean, the kids aren't listening to, so you're just like, man, they are being ugly, so they're gonna get mm, fire. Uh, or your marriage, like you're in, a, you're in a, uh, an intense moment of fellowship, but it's not so much fellowship, it's more intense and ugly, and you're just like, I'm just gonna use more communication. I'm just gonna try harder. Here we go. And it's not working. You're just, you're just spinning out of control. You're in a crazy cycle of ugliness. This is where we go, Lord, I need you. I need your spirit to breathe on us. One of my favorite songs that was sung was the breathe on us, right? Holy Spirit, fall. I mean, this is, this is what we need. We need the breath of God to breathe on us. It's not like, oh, well, you know, I just need to try a little harder and be a good person. Here we go. Zippity-doo-dah. It's not gonna work. 
That was a song I sang in fifth grade. Where did that come from? Where did that come from? Okay. We don't have Facebook Live happening, I hope. Okay. Um, even, <laughs> that's second service. So first service, I can just say whatever. Um, even though we're focusing on the last uh, half of this chapter, um, we're going to be, I, I, I want us for a moment to kind of zoom out and see the big picture of chapter three. Uh, I think it's so important that we understand the context of the surrounding verses. So we're going to break this down verse by verse here. Uh, let's start with verse one uh, and two. Uh, the, the, the theme here, is, or the question is, does being a Jew have any advantage? Now, as we go through this bullet by bullet, verse by verse, as we, we track through this, the overarching theme, theme here is a genuine Christian has a faith uh, in Christ's righteousness. So you're, it's like, okay, is my faith genuine? You're asking this question of yourself throughout uh, this outline. As we go verse by verse there, I want you to ask yourself that question, man, is my faith genuine? Uh, because cause the last, I mean, the last verse talks about like, what about the law? And then he's saying like, if if, the, if your faith is really genuine, you're going to be living it out. Uh, his righteousness is going to be lived out in you. And so I want you to be asking that overall theme, like, is my faith really genuine? Is his righteousness really in me? Has he dealt with my guilt? All that sort of thing as we break through this, okay? So does being a Jew have any advantage? Not in terms of salvation. He deals with this very, uh, very accurately, very specifically, Jews do not get cuts in line in heaven because of their bloodline. Their bloodline doesn't get them uh, cuts in line. They need Jesus just like everyone else. But listen carefully, my friends. Uh, Paul is, is, has dual citizenship. This is a rare thing. Uh, he was a Jewish, he was a Jew. He was actually a Pharisee that became a Christian. So he's now like a He's not, a, I wouldn't call him a messianic Jew because he's not like, oh, you got to get circumcised and oh, you got to do this and this. Um, but he's, he's now, a, he'd call himself a follower of Christ. But we know he has a bloodline that is from the Hebrew descendants. And so um, he's, he's a Jewish Christian, but he has dual citizenship. He's also, he's also a Roman citizen. Very interesting. So he's speaking to both audiences and um, he wants the church of Rome to remember to be thankful. Um, like, like some of the, uh, there's kind of been a schism in the church of Rome. Um, and and here's, here's what's going on is he's, he's trying to preach to the, to the uh, Jews to say like, don't, don't get all uh, petty and looking down on, your, on some of the Greeks that are in your church. And like, yeah, hey, I'm better than you. But also don't be like, well, you know, it's not a big deal. The Old Testament, it's not a big deal. It's not really a big deal that he, he came after the people of Israel. It's not a big, no, it is a big deal. So he actually says this. They're of the family line of Abraham, where we remember Father Abraham, um, where, like, remember Sarah and Abraham didn't get pregnant till like, year 100 almost, right? Talk about waiting, patience, my goodness. And then we know the promise is to the Jews, it's to, the, it's to Father Abraham, that through, through the Jews, through, the, through that lineage, there would be a multitude of, of nations that would be blessed through this promise, through this family, this bloodline, this, this Hebrew people. They also are given the law. They're entrusted with the law. They're, they're called to be basically library keepers of the law and also examples that, that, that are set apart, to, that, that, that are daily examples of the law being lived out and when it's not to repent, to repent and trust in the Messiah that would come. They're also the main receivers of special revelation as, as, as well as supernatural revelation. Uh, we, we, we see, just this is just to name a few, the Red Sea parting. That's amazing. Tri-Cities doesn't make the news very often, but can you imagine the boat races just like, you know, just that would be interesting. Maybe cause a few wrecks, but I mean... How did your, your hydroplane, I, I went through the wall of water and landed in the mud. Like what? But I mean, so, so you got the Red Sea parting, a pillar of fire leading the people um, at, at nighttime, manna from heaven, being, Moses being able to speak to the rock and, and literally a rock in the middle of the desert has water come out of it. 
Joshua's marching band, the sound of it was so deafening that it, uh, it, it, it actually caused the walls of Jericho to come down. I mean, these, this is incredible. God at work. So he's saying, yeah, don't, don't think being a Jew, just because your bloodline is Jewish, gets you cuts in line to heaven. But understand this, if you're of the people of Israel, this is, you should be thankful. You should be thankful for God choosing Israel and, and using, uh, that, that he would work and start there. Uh, the gospel is first for the Jew and the Gentile. This is a big deal. And then 1 Peter 2, 9 talks about what he's gonna do. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. Uh, in Revelation, it talks about there's going to be a multi-ethnic multitude that's able to worship because of we, we become one people, one race, one tribe under the bloodline of Jesus Christ. For the Jews that don't believe this, Paul has a heart for them. I'm going to fast forward just for a moment. Romans 9 and verse 3. And I want, I want you to listen. Please listen. This should break your heart. I, I, want, I want to ask you a question. I'm, I'm going to look you in the eyes for a second here. I want to ask you, have you ever felt like this? Okay. It's, it's a gnarly, gnarly verse for my people, my Jewish brothers. Like this is, this is Paul's prayer. Oh, now the Holy Spirit's doing this to me. <laughs> I was trying to do it to you. Like, hey, let this speak to your heart. For my Jewish brothers and sisters, I would be willing to be forever cursed, cut off from Christ, if that would save them. Have you ever hurt so bad for someone that maybe you've been praying for for years that's agnostic or even atheist? I mean, they, they're just, they, they're not interested. Or if they're, in, it's just kind of like, oh, well, God would have to seek me. Do you have that kind of heart where it's like, man, I would, if, it would, if I had the ability, I would I'd be cursed for them. That's the heart of Christ because Christ became a curse on that tree. So a genuine faith has a heart for the lost. And Paul has a heart for his Jewish brothers. He's encouraging them. He's got a baseball, he's got a hammer and he's got honey. And, he, and for those that are like, oh man, I'm getting cuts in line to heaven because of this bloodline, because I'm a Jew. He's like, boom, bring the hammer. And then for others that are just kind of like, oh, it's not a big deal, whatever. He's like, no, I mean, look at what he did. He sought the people of Israel. Look at how he gave them special revelation, how he revealed himself. This is a huge thing. And that, that through your nation, through this nation, that you, you would bless a multitude of nations, and, and that we need to have faith in the Messiah that would come. And he has come. And then number two, the point two here, this is in verses three through four as we go verse by verse through here. Uh, the question uh, or the statement raised here is, Jewish unbelief doesn't make God unjust. See, what, what can happen is you can take it too far. Just be like, oh, no, he, it's, he promised. He, he wouldn't let him down. It's taking that promise and an ap applying it too, too far to individuals and, go, and going, there's not going to be any lost. There's not going to be any lost. If, if God promised the Jews his faithfulness to deliver them and be their king forever, he is, he is just for damning the faithlessness and his promiseness. The mistake of Paul's accusers was believing that God's unconditional promises to Israel, again, applied to all individual Jews at all times. Now, I, I really believe this. Uh, if you interpret uh, Revelation this way, you're going to say, I believe there's going to be a, a huge revival of the people of Israel. I do think there's going to be a huge revival. Uh, it is very interesting that out of all the people groups, it's almost like, like China is like leading the way. They have like 50 million converts in, in their country, uh, even though they have an atheist nation. And then like, okay, so let's, the, 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 the people, the bloodline that should have the most Christians should be the Jews, you, you would think. And it's like, that's like almost the smallest. And God's like, I got a plan. I got a plan. 
And sometimes he allows things to, to suffer and to struggle. So uh, at, at the right time, he would be glorified. Think about the people of Israel. For four to 600 years, they're in slavery and bondage. And you're looking at your clock going, okay, really? God, why are you taking so long? What's going on? So I really believe if, I'm, if, my, um, uh, if I'm interpreting this correctly in Revelation, there's going to be a, a mass revival of the people of Israel. All right. Okay, but again, is God justified for punishing sinners and, and even damning Jews that reject him? Verses five through 18 touches on this. A genuine faith uh, knows that we all deserve God's wrath. If your faith is genuine, you're gonna go, we, we all deserve Jews and Gentiles. All of us deserve God's wrath. Romans three and verse 10 says this. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Isaiah 53 and verse six goes on and expounds and says, all we like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And then he goes on in verses 19 and 20 and reminds us what, what he's already said in, in, in the previous chapter. The law cannot save us from our sin. A genuine faith, no, like a genuine faith that has the righteousness of Christ alive in them knows that man, apart from Christ's righteousness, we are weak. We are sinners. We will struggle. We will toil. We desperately need, we desperately need um, saving. Galatians 3.24 says this, let me put it another way, the law was our guardian until Christ came. Or the King James says a schoolmaster uh, to show us our need for, for Jesus Christ. And then in verses 21 through 26, again, we're doing an outline here, we're breaking this down. We are made right by faith in Christ. Someone say faith out loud, say it. And not just having a faith in, in, in God, like in James it says, good for you if you have a faith in God. Even the, the, the demons believe that though. Like what, what kind of faith do we, do we have? Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this is not of yourselves, but it is a gift of God. Even your faith is a gift. His righteousness, like we, we can't be made right by God, I loved how Jason said that. I mean, uh, when he was leading worship, we, we can't do it. This is God uh, making things right. And then just us, us having faith in it. It's like us being stuck on Mars and like we can't ever get off, on, uh, get, get off the pl planet on our own. We, we need deliverance. And it's like God has provided that space shuttle, if you will, and do we have faith to get in it? Or are we too stubborn to stay on the planet? The red planet. <laughs> Faith, we have to have faith in Christ paying for our sins, being the propitiation, that, that word means absorbing the wrath of God, satisfying, uh, in other words, he satisfies the wrath of God, it's, it's squashed, it's taken care of, it's paid for, this is a big deal, um, it's not just like, oh, a neat rabbi died on the cross, that's nifty that he did that, and God is pleased for a moment, it is, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sacrifice that lasts Forever, it's eternal. Look at Matthew 6 and verse 33, but seek first the kingdom of God and his, someone finish it, righteousness. This, his righteousness. And then what's promised? And all these things shall be added unto you. Some people are like, so what we need to do, okay, is look at all the, the good lessons we can learn from God. The Bible. So let's look at David and Goliath. Oh, look at that shepherd boy. He was righteous by going out there and taking out Goliath. So boys and girls, this is the lesson we need to take out. Uh, we need to be brave and courageous. Jonah, the story of Jonah, like, wow, look at how he, he just did such a good job at, no, he did not, right? We, 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 I mean, we can, it, it's like going, man, we need the right, there's none righteous, no, not one. I mean, David, uh, we, we see him um, commits adultery, then uh, he, he gets the girl pregnant that he commits adultery with, so he's like, oh, shoot, I need to do conspiracy uh, to cover it up. And then when that doesn't work, then he murders. But we were just saying we need to follow David, like David, he was a righteous guy, he was good. 
The, the, the Bible's not full of these amazing heroes that we just like follow them. Uh, all of them would say like, no, 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 Jesus is the better Jonah. Jesus is the better David. Jesus is the better, <laughs> way better Samson. Jesus is the better, you know. Yeah, do I even go there, right? Actually, it is kind of interesting. Um, uh, Samson is put up between two pillars. Jesus is put up between two thieves. Okay, I, I'm, I'm elaborating here. This is not in the Bible. Uh, it's just my, it seems to me, and he he overcomes and crushes by being crushed. Samson's crushed, and, and Jesus is crushed on the cross. Okay, I'm going too far with that. But Jesus is the better Samson, all right? Um, and and he, the better everything. We need his righteousness. But the wrong way to interpret the Bible is to look for, for heroes in it. That, that name is not Jesus. And to go like, oh, look at David. He's a neat guy. And look at Moses. He's, he's really cool. And I need to be a nice guy or a nice gal like, uh, you know, these guys and gals in the Bible. Let's do that. And make this a, a do-good book. Let's be do-gooders and try really hard. Now, now, here is something you need to understand. If you have a genuine faith, there's going to be some good things you do out of, out of trusting in the goodness of God. His righteousness being alive in us. So important that we understand this. So we have faith in Christ paying for our sins, being the propitiation, absorbing the wrath, satisfying the wrath of God, but also of faith in Christ washing away our sins by his precious blood. And then Paul does something very interesting in verses 27 and 28, again, as we've been going verse by verse through here. Can we brag about being accepted? Can we brag? There's no room for, for bragging. Paul says this, I claim to know nothing except Christ. If I boast in anything, it is Christ at work in me. Yeah. So there's no room in bragging. And this, the natural man and woman hates this. The sinful f flesh uh, wants to push back on this and says, yeah, yeah, the, the, the blood of Jesus is good, but after all that I can do, there's gotta be some stuff that I do, right? Here's some, I wanna read my notes. Enjoying Christ's grace, truly, and that, that word grace, if you wanna take some notes here, you can look this up in the Strong's Concordance. This is true. It's not just a definition of an unmerited favor, although it is, that's part of it. Grace equals unmerited favor, but it also means, are you ready for this? The divine influence on the heart. Ephesians 1. You know, it talks about um, having the eyes of our hearts enlightened that you may know of the hope to which he has called you. This is, this is so important. Like, I mean, we're, when we're enjoying God's grace, that he's absorbed the wrath of God, he's, he's washed away our sin. Um, we don't boast in ourselves at all. I mean, it, it actually puts to death the appetite and the panting and the longing for self-justification. And, there, and there's no place for pride in this place. It's like, man, I'm a, I need you, Lord. Lord, I need you. Now, since faith is key, this is the last question in the, in the outline. So since faith is key, what about the law? Verses 29 and 31 uh, hit on this. Look at Matthew 5 and verse 17. You can see it on the Sky Bible or turn in your Bibles there. Do, do not think that I have come to abolish the law. This is Jesus speaking. Or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. To fulfill them, to, to pay for them. I mean, to, to, so now it's like, man, now I can put, the, um, I can put the, my spirit in you and now the, you, you can start living it out, living out the righteousness of God. It, it, it's that time of year again that we, we pull weeds. Um, we were actually running late for something and like, hey why were you running late and, I was, and then I t it's because I started pulling some weeds I'm like, yeah, I'll just pull one I'll just pull two and then there's 20 and then there's 30 the best way to weed a garden is to plant the right stuff in your garden 
to begin with, to, to sow seeds of the spirit rather than sowing seeds of the flesh. We want to sow seeds. We want to plant seeds of the Holy Spirit. Go, Lord, breathe on me, Lord, and help me to, to understand your righteousness on my own. I have no righteousness on my own. Um, I, I need you, Lord. I, I want to be hungry for you. Or even being honest and going, Lord, I'm not very hungry for you right now. Can you put that in me? Will you put a desire for, for me to be hungry for your word, to be hungry to actually daily experience you, to connect with you. Our faith should show Christ at work in us. If you're taking notes, you can actually see it on the screen. Our faith should, should be so genuine that Christ is actually at work in us. That's how we know there's a genuine faith in us. I'm gonna share something that uh, is, is maybe gonna stir you, it's gonna shake you up a little bit. And I... I'll just read it. Here it is. Hudson Taylor in 1865 was at a worship gathering in England. He's worshiping with his people. 1865. And he was sickened by the apathy around him. Now we need to be careful that we don't look around us and be like, oh, look at you and look at you. So apathetic. And that we don't be judgmental. I mean, it's, it's, we gotta be careful. But he was just sickened at, at the spirit was illuminating his heart to, to see the spiritual apathy around him and people rejoicing in their own security while millions, while millions in the world were perishing for their lack of knowing and experiencing the gospel. So Hudson Taylor, again, he's sickened by people that are willing to just enjoy the security and the comfort of Christ while millions are dying without him. He's like, how can this be? And so Hudson Taylor goes on a mission, a mission effort to, to China, and he helps be a foundation for further ministry where there, there is now over 50 million converts. Hmm, interesting. The Holy Spirit really hit me this, because that's all I had in my notes and I was gonna move on to my next point. While we were singing, the Spirit hit me with something, is you don't have to go to China to see the lost around you. Oh, let's go to China if you want. I've been there. It's awesome. We, we help plant a church in J Japan. We have Turkey. We have people going to Haiti. That's great. Have a heart for them. We need to do it. When I was in Japan, I've never cried so hard. I go back to my, uh, it's, it's literally uh, less than 1% in the largest city in the world, Tokyo. Tokyo, the largest city in the world, and less than 1% are Christian. I, I had to go, when I felt the lostness, I'm getting goosebumps in this jacket. I, I go back to my, I go back to my hotel and I, and I weep, I weep, um, just, just weep at the lostness. I feel the lostness around me. But here's the, yeah, you can go to Japan, you can go to Haiti, and we should. There, there's some great trips that you should go on. We need to pray for them. Our church supports them. If some of you are like, man, I don't know where the, the money goes uh, here at Crossfield, there's no secrets here. You can ask us any question you want on our money. But I'll tell you what, I, I, I can look you in the face with a good conscience and say your money is going to some good things, okay? And, and, and there's, there's, we, we support a church in England. And, but here's the deal. We're in the city for the city. From Trey Cities all the way to Tokyo, we need to care about our city as well. There's, some of us are enjoying the, the, the security we have in Christ. We're lifting our hands and singing about the old rugged cross, while around us, in our neighborhoods, across, the, the, uh, across our office at work, are people perishing and we're too offended. Or even on Facebook, we, got, uh, we have 3,000 friends. They're not really your friends, guys. But anyways, 3,000 friends that like you. Last week, only 20, I guess, like me. But anyways, that liked whatever. I don't know. We, we do that. <laughs> that are perishing. And we're like, ah, but I can't. I can't post that. That'd be too much, too soon. Can't offend. Listen to this parable. Oh, I need to share this before I read the parable. Our faith should show Christ's actual work in us. And there's a parable that helps remind us of the false security of thinking you have a genuine faith when you do not. Listen to this parable. 
Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. Let me say it again. There's ten there's ten virgins, five of them are foolish, five are wives. Stay with me. Uh, wise. Uh, verse 3. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. I'll say it again. They took no oil. They took no oil. And let me help you. The oil is always in Scripture. Whether it's in an anointing of a sick person or an anointing of a king, it's to signify the Spirit of God. They didn't take the Spirit. Tracking with me? Okay. They took no oil with them, but the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, they also became drowsy and they slept. Makes me think of the disciples that slept in the garden. Let me keep going. But at midnight, there was a cry. Here is the bridegroom. Let me remind you, if you're new to the Christian faith, Jesus is the bridegroom. We are the bride of Christ. He could come like a thief in the night. We need to be ready. Come out to meet him. Verse 7, those, uh, then all those virgins rose and trimmed, trimmed their, their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, that means they're getting the, the, they're getting the lamps ready. Give us some of your oil. That's almost like the, the foolish person that, that made fun of Noah. Noah's now in the ark and they're just like, let us in. Let us in. Not by the hair of my chin. No, I'm just kidding. But, but the, I have to make sure you're paying attention. Verse 9. But the wise answer, again, they're saying like, give us some of your oil. We're out. They want to, you never had any to begin with, okay? Isn't that like what the religious say? Like, oh, I'm just, I'm just not feeling the spirit today. And you want to say like, you never had it. You know, oh, sorry, buddy, sorry. Uh, verse nine, but the wise answered saying, since there will not be enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy it for yourselves. While they were going to buy, the bridegroom came and those who were ready went in and him to the marriage feast and the door was shut. The door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, truly I say to you, I do not know you, whatever. Watch therefore for you know neither the day nor the hour. Wow, wow. Taking no oil is like trying to do the work of God without the powerfully encouraging uh, fire of the Holy Spirit. I think about this sometimes. I'm like, man, I need to inspire the church more to give. Like we're actually gonna have to, I just found out first quarter, it's hard to say this, but we're gonna have to make some cuts. We're gonna have to do some trimmings uh, with our budget. Not super fun to give you that news. Uh, God's doing some incredible things. We baptized seven people on Easter. Our, 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 more people are coming and giving <laughs> kind of just, yeah. Uh, but it's like, man, I need to inspire them. And then the Holy Spirit, I, I see this on, on Facebook. It just, it hits me. It's like pastors can inspire, but only the Holy Spirit can transform. Okay. Next. It's just like, wow, the, the fire of the Holy Spirit. I mean, this is, this is actually encouraging. This is exciting. Oh, the, the church needs to, to actually show up on time or they need to actually, you know, you know help with, with this or they need to help with that. They need to, you know, give more of their time and, you know, talent and treasure. They need to be more generous. I need to try harder. Maybe if I wear a bow tie or maybe whatever. I'm kidding. But, but there's, there's that, like, I need to try harder. I need to inspire more. And then, like, the, the word of God is saying, no, it's the fire of God. I got, a, I got a quote, Francis Chan, again, he says this, people don't experience the power of God because they're doing nothing that requires the power of the Holy Spirit. Like, like some of you are like, oh, I, can't, I, can't do, I can't go to my neighbor, I can't go to my school, I can't go to Haiti, I can't do this, I can't do, I'm scared, I can't give, my, my finances are tight, or I, I can't do this or that. Fire of the Holy Spirit, trust in him, trust in, in him. Okay, we bought a house uh, four years ago and uh, it looks like a house out of Leavenworth. Have you ever seen it? I, I, I love it. It's an old house. Um, it's a Swiss house, it's a fun house. It has a large shed in the backyard. Um, when I say large shed, like it, it's like almost as big as our like first house that we was like 400 square feet. It's not that big, but feels like it. It's a, one of those tiny houses type things. So we're like, man, we got to take the shed and, and make the, the, the back part of it like a little playhouse for the kids. Okay. On Tuesday afternoon this last week, I got excited uh, to sleep outside with the older kids in the playhouse. It was 60 degrees outside. And my, my wife was like, really? 
You're going to do this? I'm like, no, it'll be fine. It's going to be great. Let's do it. And so we, we start working. We're cleaning it out. I'm putting some paneling up. Things are going great. As I'm putting the paneling up, my wife's like, hey, do you want some, are you sure you don't want to like insulate this or something? No, no, it'll be fine. It's a playhouse. We live in Tri Cities. It's 60 outside. It'll be great. This is this last week, by the way. It'll be fine. Why are you guys laughing at me? Stop it. And then like, I mean, I, I decked out that, that playhouse. I made it look good. Some of us, we do this with our religion. Like we dress up for church. We write the nice check. I mean, our kids are baptized, catechized. We've memorized that. I mean, we are good to go. We put a carpet over the particle board, paneling up. My daughter Harper's like, this is so cute, daddy. This is neat. And again, you know where the story's going. You just know, and that's why some of you are already laughing. I failed to insulate the playhouse and it got down to 39 degrees. Now, before you hate on me and call CPS, I, I did listen to my wife right before bed. I'm like, you know what? I'll, I'll put a space heater in here because it's, you know, like I said, it's, it's, an, it's a decked out playhouse. We got an electrical in there. So we plug it in. It does not help very much. Like I think, I, th I mean, you put that in your room, it's gonna be like toasty, 80 degrees if you don't turn it down. I have it cranked all the way up. What I had failed to do is there was a draft. Remember, the back part of the playhouse shares, it's shared with the actual shed. Well, the shed, um, yeah, did not have a space heater in it. And the space heater couldn't keep up. And so it's probably a, a warm whopping 50 in there, or 40, I don't know. It was freezing. I didn't insulate. I didn't, didn't come with the oil, if you will, right? I, I was in, in trouble. Look at Matthew 7, 24 and 25. This is about, it's an analogy, not about a playhouse, okay? Uh, but, but look at what's essential in this house. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be a wise man who... Uh, who built his house on, on the rock and the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And the rock is Jesus Christ. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who builds his house on the sand or puts particle board up without insulation, Okay. Uh, a sign that, may, as we close, a, a sign that maybe your house or, uh, or your faith is on sinking sand or without insulation or without oil, whatever analogy helps you, is if you are more concerned about over... Now listen, this is up on the screen here. Are you more concerned about overcoming a sinful habit than you are about the fact that your sin grieves the very heart of God? Think about that. I'm going to overcome this. I'm going to beat this. I can do this. Uh, Paul's writing to the church of Rome and some of these Hebrew people that have become Christians, uh, they just sprinkled uh, the gospel on their, on their self-justification instead of going, I need to put to death this self-justification. There's nothing uh, good uh, uh, in me. There's none righteous, no, not one. I need the righteousness of Christ. I need the spirit of God. I need the oil of gladness. I need to pant as a deer pants for water. I need to desire him and not just want to overcome a sinful habit because uh, I, I, I can, oh man, I, I've done this, but to go, man, this grieves the very heart of God. And I love God. Romans 8 and verse 7, for the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. In other words, they don't love God for it does not submit to God's laws. Indeed, it cannot. So how do we know if our faith is genuine or if it's full of hypocrisy. Jonathan Edwards says this, hypocrites are, deficients, are, are deficient in the duty of prayer. Here's a couple marks of genuine faith. I'm gonna hit these real quick and then I'll be done, guys. A love for God. Number one, a love for God. Psalm 1 and verse 2, his delight is in the law of the Lord and day and night he meditates on it. You're gonna actually be a creature of the, of the word, not a creature of the world, but a creature of the word where you're gonna be hungry for it. Guys, I, I haven't been diagnosed, but I know it. I'm sure I have ADD and ADHD and all these different things. I don't like to read at times. The spirit of God makes me hungry to read this. It's like, well, that's a, that's a work of the Lord. 
I'd rather see things in high def 3D surround sound. Like, what? I have to squint when I read this. Okay, here we go. It's like a creature of the word where we're hungry for this because we have a love for God. Not like, oh, I have a duty to do this. Here we go. But like, Lord, I love you. When I read this, I connect with you. I commune with you. And then number two, a mark of a genuine faith will be repentance from sin and hatred for it. Where you're not just concerned about a personal victory of overcoming a sin, but enjoying the victory of Jesus Christ and, and wanting to bring glory to him. Also, not just confession, but transformation. Transformation. Point three, genuine humility. A willingness to, to give up comfort and take up the cross. Going, Lord, I want to humble myself before you. Um, I, I, that, so there's going to be a genuine hum, humility. Point four is a devotion to God's glory. Philippians 1 and verse 20 says, This Christ shall be exalted, whether by life or by death. For me to live as Christ and to die as gain. I mean, either way, if I'm alive or I'm dead, God's going to be glorified. And then prayer. That we're, we're honest to, to say, man, I'm, I'm, I, 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 wanna, I need to pray more. But actually not just confessing that, but longing to pray more. Longing to connect with Him. Point six is a joyful giving. A joyful giving of our time, talent, and treasure. Going, man, we need to be consistent. Do you, do you want to know what CrossFit's problem is? It's not like we need more money. Do you, you guys know what we need? Ready? Consistency. We got, we got like, uh, do you know what every church does in the, in the world? It braces for impact for um, the season of vacation. Oh, summer. Well, we need to, hold on. You know, here's the budget guy. Pastor, we need to, to be ready for vacation you know, and so can, can we trim our budget so we're ready for that? It's like, man, let's just be consistent. Let's be consistent. Like, I'm in, if I'm at the Oregon coast, it's like, man, I, I'm still, I'm still praying for the, for the church. I'm watching the sermon online and praying for the person preaching. Steve, you're still preaching for me when I go to the Oregon coast real soon? Are you doing it? Okay, good. You know, like we're still, uh, we're, we're praying for each other. And it's not like, well, <laughs> I don't have to worry about cross you. Here we go. Well, no, I don't have to worry about CrossFit. Christ has it, but I, I, not out of duty, but joy. Man, I get to pray for Steve preaching. I get to pray for people to respond and Bud Brown and them helping with announcements and, and prayer time and response time. This is great. And I could give online or, I mean, it's like I, I don't have to take a vacation from, from serving God and loving him. And then the last point is spiritual growth. Spiritual growth. That you're actually getting discipled that you, you have someone, a mentor that's discipling you. Uh, I, have, I have two, two uh, incredible guys that, are, that, that pastor me, that also the elders. I'm getting coaching and counseling. So I have mentors pouring into me. <laughs> Probably too many. <laughs> no, I, I need lots. Um, but I'm also discipling others. Okay. I've been a little long-winded, but this is, this is so important, guys. Um, I, I'm gonna just hit you with this. Why do we need the passage? There's a tendency to say like, oh, I love the gospel and I hate guilt, so my faith is genuine. Here's the main idea again. When we, when we have a genuine faith in Christ, work on the cross, his righteousness will be, will be lived out in us. His righteousness will literally not just put us in right standing, but, but we'll be alive. We'll, we'll, we'll care for the lost. We'll want to be consistent because he's consistently loving us. So let's go to the throne. Let's pray and respond. Lord, help us as we...